Shocker Baseball on WSU TV as Wichita State and Furman wrap up a three game series. It's been all Shockers the first two, winning by scores of 11 to 1 and 14 to 3. Shockers going for win number 17 on the year. Furman's first trip ever to Wichita. Three days, three different wind directions. Today, apparently, it's going to be out of the east at about 11 miles an hour. So, a right handed pull hitter will get some help. Here this morning, Shane Dennis and Denning Gehrig here at X Stadium. And anytime I guess, Denning, that you have a season high in runs and hits, that must mean that a lot of different people get in the act. And that's what happened here yesterday. One through nine, Wichita State got contributions from just about everybody in the lineup on Friday. It was the seven-run seventh. Yesterday, a five-run fourth that really blew this thing open. You can see right there, up and down the lineup, just about everyone contributed in some form or fashion. And the approach was so good against Furman starter Grant Sherman. Just about every right-handed hitter was willing to take a fastball in the outer part of the plate and drive it the other way. Here you see Gunnar Troutwine taking it out to right field. Hunter Gibson, Jordan Boyer both had the same concept as well. It was just a very balanced offensive effort in the Shockers' cruise to victory. And the guy that benefited, obviously, was the starter for Wichita State, Liam Eddy. He was great once again. He's pitched very well all, to, all together this season, but most effectively at home. We're starting to sound like a broken record when we're talking about Liam Eddy, but he has just been so consistent every time out. Gives the Shockers a chance to win each time that he takes the ball. And not pitching like a freshman. His demeanor so calm and composed. The Shockers love having him go on a Saturday. Now, Wichita State, the one thing that's been in flux a little bit has been the Sunday starter and an interesting choice today. And Tommy Barnhouse, even though he started eight times last year, started as a closer this year. Yeah, working out of the back end of the bullpen to start the year. But Mike Steele and Todd Butler feel like he's a guy who has the ability to start, of course, did it last year and can give them a little bit of length when he gets stretched out. But it'll be interesting to see how many innings they're asking out of him today. We'll see who the uh, defense has behind him and the starting lineup for Furman and the first pitch when we come back WSU TV. Shockers are two wins away from 18 and four. And the last time they got off to that good of a start after 22 games, 13 years ago. So they're chasing a little bit of history and setting some pretty high marks along the way, both offensively and on the mound. Here's how they'll stack up defensively. There was a, a couple of different lineups. One was, of course, the early one. And then after a bit of testing, you would assume Dayton Duga and Grayson Jenister were both in the original starting lineup, neither in the lineup uh, as it was updated, oh, probably 30, 35 minutes ago. And we'll see Travis Young in center. Luke Ritter was a vis uh, in there originally, but he was going to play left. Josh DeBacker has uh, been added to the defensive lineup as well. And Garrett Kosas getting his first start at first base. So uh, Denning for a team that prides itself on defense as much as anything else. Might get tested today. There's some guys in some new positions. Yeah, Grayson Jones just got banged up yesterday, so it may not be the worst thing in the world that he gets a day off. But for as consistent as some of these spots have been where you can pretty much pencil in the same names in the lineup day in and day out, this is a little bit of a departure from the norm. We're going to get a chance to see some new guys at new spots. And Tommy Barnhouse, as we alluded to in the last segment, will get his first start of the season after starting as the shocker closer. This has been a forgettable trip to Wichita for this offense of uh, Furman. They're hitting 131 in the series. They've been outscored 25 to four. They have just eight hits, seven of them singles. So it's been a tough go for the Paladin 
of position players this weekend. Just one guy with multiple hits so far in the series, and I think a big part of it is that Wichita State has done an excellent job of holding down Ben Anderson. He came in hitting right at 400, does not have a hit yet in the series, though he has walked three times. He's the one who really kickstarts his Paladin offense, and if you can keep him in check, it's hard for Furman to produce runs. So, what should we expect from Tommy Barnhouse if he's sharp? Three or four, maybe? I think that's a, probably the best guess, and I'm not sure how many pitches that Mike Steele is willing to let him go. Of course, he's been used in a relief role so far this year. His max is two innings. His career high is five innings last year as a starter, but I can't imagine he has stretched out to that point, at least at this point in the year. He threw two innings in the final game of the McNeese State Series opening weekend. He threw two innings against Nebraska on the fourth. That turned out to be the ninth and the tenth, a game in which he gave up a couple of home runs and took his only loss of the year. So we'll see what happens. And Ben Anderson, the aforementioned leadoff man for Furman, will climb into the left-hand batter's box, and off we go. Anderson still leads the team in hitting. There you see at 378, but as... Denning mentioned which, uh, Wichita State has kept the clamps on him pretty well. 0 oh, for 5 officially with those three walks, but he's also struck out three times. And the first pitch of the game is right in there. 11-32 first pitch. Don't often say that outside of a conference tournament, for example. But with Furman and this being getaway day, give them a couple extra hours to make sure they make their flight. Nothing in two to Ben Anderson. Expect to see a lot of fastballs from Tommy Barnhouse this afternoon. That is definitely his primary offering. He uses it a bunch out of the bullpen and converting to his starting role on relatively short notice. I imagine he is just going to stick with the bread and butter. Well, they made quick work of Ben Anderson. And to your point, Denning, you, first of all, you don't change who you are. You are what you are. You can't just uh, invent new pitches because you're in a, in a new role. But Mike Steele kind of uh, drove home your point that his message to almost every pitcher, I'm sure every pitcher, is you do you. You know, th there are certain things that you do well that there's a reason why you're out there. So, you know, for Tommy Barnhouse to change his mentality, yeah, maybe. But as far as, like you mentioned, as you put it, the bread and butter, stick with what got you there. And again, with him not really being stretched out since you're not expecting five, six innings from Tommy Barnhouse. He can kind of treat it like a relief appearance in some ways and just pitch the same way. Attack with fastballs, be aggressive in the zone, and he's certainly done that through his first five pitches. Yes, he has. And we were joking about it a little bit yesterday when some kids these days want their roles defined, and back in the day it was, well, your role is to get outs until I like, take the ball away from you. I think that's probably a pretty good uh, type of mentality if Tommy Barnhouse attacks it that way. I'll give everything I have until Mike Steele takes the ball from me. So, so far, so good. Two fastballs for strikes and a breaking ball to put him away has been the formula so far. That's a dandy. Working mm -hmm. down in the zone and gets Heatner to wave over the top of it. But six pitches, two strikeouts. A good way to start for sure for Tommy Barnhouse. Working on an immaculate inning. Seven in a row in the strike zone. Here's Jake Crawford. Again, when you hit 131 in the series, nobody's going to have a, a whole lot of success. But Crawford, I think we would agree, would be the most dangerous guy. He's only got the one hit, but he's driven in two. Two runs single yesterday. Oh, and two. That fastball at 93, so a little extra on that heater out away from Crawford. So Barnhouse is one strike away from a nine-pitch strike out the side first. Oh, how about it? <laughs> <laughs> we might have to settle for 10, but the, that was a good try. Almost the same formula, too, to yep. all three hitters. Two fastballs, and the, that breaking ball stayed a little more elevated than I think he would have liked. Crawford's too good of a hitter to let that one go by. Wow. 
back this way, still 0-2. Well, the good thing, uh, one good thing about a 14 to 3 victory yesterday is that your quote unquote guys down in the pen were not needed yesterday. So, especially when you get a, st a spot start from a guy on a Sunday, your main bridge guys all good and rested down there. That's certainly a good thing. So, I guess up until yesterday, we thought Tommy Barnhouse was one of those one of guys. Those guys right. So, he is rested enough clearly to, to get the ball on a Sunday, but. Chandler Sandburn should be good to go, along with several others down there who have served in some important roles. And Todd Butler has the luxury of having just about everyone available today. And he's also, unless we find out otherwise later, got Connor Lungwitz, who is a starter type that can come in after Tommy Barnhouse if he's only able to go two or three innings. And he definitely is stretched out. If he comes into the game early, if the situation calls for it, he can go deep into the game. I think that was a dropped third strike, potentially. That was called ball one. So finally, Barnhouse throws one out of the strike zone. Don and Strobel looked like he was ready to ring mm -hmm. up Crawford, but Troutwine couldn't squeeze it on a breaking ball that maybe leaked back out towards the inner part of the plate. Thought maybe it was a foul tip, but Conan Strobel says no. And at the moment, we have a one, two, three inning for Tommy Barnhouse and striking out the side, but the umpires will come together and visit about it. And we'll have the result for you when we come back on WSU TV. Wichita State University is preparing today's students to become tomorrow's leaders. The Shock the World campaign is raising $25 million in private funds for a new home for the W. Frank Barton School on the Innovation Campus. Invest today in tomorrow's business leaders by calling 316-978-4076 or visit www.wichita.edu slash shock the world. Trying to go back through my mental Rolodex and find out when there's been a time this weekend where something has gone right for Furman on this trip there. That'll really rack your brain, a few don't you? and far mm -hmm. between. There was a somewhat disputed swing and a miss on the final out of that first inning that was argued by their head coach, uh, coach Brett Harker. All the umpires got together and they ruled it was not a foul tip into the dirt. And so it turns into a three up and three down strike out the side inning for Tommy Barnhouse. Now Matt Lazaro will get his chance after Wichita State put up 11 on Friday and 14 more yesterday. Lazaro making his sixth start of the season. Opponents hitting 311 against him, 38 hits in those 29 innings. There's a defense behind him. Third different second baseman in as many days, Dylan Love. It's your turn today. <laughs> They've tried out a couple different combinations there, but for the most part, it's stayed fairly consistent in the, the starting defensive alignment. So Kosas and Wallace will be in there. A couple of freshmen for the Shockers, as well as Josh Jabacker getting the start and left. And Luke Ritter will lead it off. The Shockers numbers coming into the game yesterday, not all that good against left-hand starters or left-hand pitching in general. But, boy, they really... Let Grant Sherman have it yesterday. Two quick strikes to Luke Ritter. 
expect to see a lot of strikes from Matt Lazaro. Only four walks in 29 innings coming into play today. He will be around the zone. Tried the inside corner and missed one and two. Ritter four out of nine with three runs scored, a pair of doubles. So he's had a good series. Of course, when you hit 408 and rack up 29 hits in two games, bound to have some heroes in there. Ritter triggered late and fouls it up into the stands. Matt Lazaro, six feet, 175, just a freshman from Marietta, Georgia. So both pitchers have come out throwing strikes. It'll be interesting to see if Lazaro has a different game plan than Sherman yesterday, who, as we know, was pretty much going to attack the outside corner with fastballs to both righties and lefties, and the Shockers made him pay for it. Early indications, at least, Lazaro is willing to go inside a little bit more than Sherman was. In the air to center, Anderson's got it measured. And that's one away. And to further your point, you got Taplet behind the plate. He caught yesterday. He saw what happened to Grant Sherman. So the catcher, just as much as anybody else, understands what's working and what's not from a particular pitcher. And Sherman's tried to basically switch up the strategy midstream when almost every Wichita State right-hand batter was taking him to right field. Vickers shoots one into right center for a base hit. Only Trey's second hit of the series. He's on there with one out. And now Alec Bohm. Be interesting to see what this Wichita State offense looks like today without Grayson Genista and Duga in the lineup. Of course, they've kind of started platooning Duga lately, but Genista's been in there virtually every single inning before today and a rock in the two hole too and it just makes for a different feel to this lineup when you don't have his bat there looming in the two spot it seems like he comes up in run producing situations so often it'll be up to Trey Vickers to produce in those spots today Bohm shoots one into center field he's had a good series he's now five for nine so back to back singles and that sets the table for Paxton Wallace Another base hit to the right of second base for Alec Bohm. That has been the storyline for him over the last several weeks. A willingness to go to the opposite field, stay back up the middle with his approach. And that's so impressive when you consider his power. It would be easy for him to try and yank everything mm -hmm. and roll over to shortstop a bunch. But he has not fallen into that trap. Wallace had a pair of hits yesterday. And he goes after the first pitch and fouls it back. One of those hits was his first shocker home run. On the season, Wallace, five out of 14, double and a homer. This firm and staff will come at you with fastballs a lot, early in counts, too. And if you're ready, you're probably going to get something to hit in the first pitch or two. Nothing in two to Paxton Wallace. Ritter fly to center, and then Vickers and Bohm with opposite field base hits. Gunnar Troutwine, who's homered in both games of the series, waiting on deck. Troutwine's got his average up near 300. What a pleasant surprise that has been for Wichita State. And the power, too. You knew it was in the tank somewhere. He just didn't get many chances to flash it last year, but has grabbed the starting job and ran with it through the first 20 games of this season. And Wallace goes down on strikes and actually... Clipped oh, Taplet on the backswing, I think. I was going to say, a home plate umpire... Conan Strobel called timeout just to make sure that Taplet was okay. So two away, and here's Troutwine. Troutwine, 16 out of 55. Three doubles, three homers, 13 driven in on the year. 
Three for six in the series, two home runs. Hitting 333 with runners on this year and 312 with runners in scoring position. So he has excelled in these spots. He took advantage of the wind in each of the first two games of the series. It was blowing out Friday, so he pulled one into the bleachers, blowing toward right yesterday, so he went with the wind yesterday to right field. And so if he wants to drop and drive and try to jerk one here, the wind would help him. Shockers will hit the road next week, and I think that'll probably really tell the tale with this team. 16 and four is a tremendous start, but huge test next week at Central Arkansas and then at ECU. You hope they don't overlook Central Arkansas. That team can swing it a little bit in the midweek. That'll be a test before conference play begins. And again, both these teams have had to wait the Southern Conference season has started as well as the American, so these two guys will be late to the party. One and two to Troutwine. Shockers make a little noise here in the first. And right at the third baseman, Crawford. So Troutwine hit it well, but the Shockers are turned away in the first. Charles Koch Arena is the place where we gather as a community to compete against the very best. Now our game plan is to renovate Koch Arena by adding a new student athlete success center. Your tax deductible gift can help deliver that slam dunk. Join us at the level that is right for you. Donate online at wichita.edu slash shock the world. Well, one way to take the pressure off of a defensive alignment that is very unique, and that is the seven guys behind Tommy Barnhouse have never started in this capacity together in a game. One way to take care of that is strike everybody out. I've heard that helps. Yeah. yeah. And if, if the ball doesn't actually go into play, then that defense doesn't have to do anything. And so that's good. 19 innings and 28 strikeouts for the Shocker pitchers in this series and it's not just a series thing this is a season long thing wichita state's pitchers are turning in a really special year so far haven't seen many games where they haven't notched at least one strikeout per inning and as we've talked about it is not just two or three guys carrying that load as far as the strikeouts it is up and down this pitching staff and just about everyone in the bullpen piling up the punch outs at a historic rate Elmi will lead it off, the Paladin first baseman, then Landon Kay and Trent Alley here in the second. Tommy Barnhouse struck out the side in the first. Got Anderson looking, and then Hebner and Crawford swinging. One pitch, one out. Travis Young runs it down in center field. Oh, Tommy Barnhouse is going to make it three or four this afternoon. He could certainly use a couple of these. Yep. And if you keep attacking with fastballs in the strike zone, you're going to get some balls in play. Good start for him here in the second. Landon Kay is the one guy that Denning talked about. Has a multi-hit series. He's the only guy with two hits, two out of six. And he had to weather a miserable slump earlier in the season. But he seemingly has... Figured some things out. Got his average up to 234 on the year. 15 out of 64. Two doubles and a triple.
Furman just, they need a little bit more from him, to be frank. Preseason all-conference guy, had 11 home runs last year, hit over 330. To him coming to play today, hitting at 234, probably not what Brett Harker and his Furman staff expected. And he had to get hot just to get there. Mm -hmm. This is a team a year ago that really hit 312 overall. They hit 69 home runs. Their team ERA wasn't great, but it's better than it is now. They were 485 with their ERA. They were preseason fourth in the media poll, sixth in the coaches poll in the conference preseason voting. 33 and 28 last year. They ended up 14 and 10 in the Southern Conference. And as Denning mentioned, their head coach, Brett Harker, he is a pitcher, pitching background. Should so mention, too, that they, they lost their ace from last year, Will Gaddis, who went in the third round to the Colorado Rockies. That's the highest a player has ever been drafted from the Furman program, so not an easy guy to replace. Another strikeout for Barnhouse. That's two up and two down. Five in a row set down, four by way of strikeout. And to kind of close the book on the thought on Brett Harker, this has got to be particularly painful for him this weekend in particular, but generally the start to the season. His guys haven't thrown it quite the way I'm sure he expected them to. And you and I were talking before we went on the air. This is a team that last year really threw strikes very consistently. And... It's kind of confounding that that part of the equation just kind of dried up this year. I mean, they've lost home plate. Last year, this was one of the best teams in the country at throwing the ball over home plate. They only walked 156 batters. That was eighth best in the country in terms of the walk rate. And this year, they have already walked 104. That's just normally a skill like that is very transferable. You'll see some variance in terms of hits allowed, but walk rate, typically from year to year stays fairly consistent if you bring back the same guys. Tommy Barnhouse is just living on that outside edge. And that's again, nothing in two. On the other hand, this Wichita State staff has seen pretty much the same guys all make quantum leaps in almost every department. When you look at the stat sheet, hit standings pitch, strikeouts, strikeouts to walks. Tommy Barnhouse has got a magic ball through the first two innings. Five punch outs for Tommy. Wichita State University is preparing today's students to become tomorrow's leaders. The Shock the World campaign is raising $25 million in private funds for a new home for the W. Frank Barton School on the Innovation Campus. Invest today in tomorrow's business leaders by calling 316-978-4076 or visit www.wichita.edu slash shock the world. There's been a couple of outings that have made Matt Lazaro's numbers look a little inflated. He gave up 10 hits in four innings against NC State earlier this year and 12 hits in seven innings against Central Connecticut State. But the other three starts that he's had have been very good. And he looked sharp in that first inning against Wichita State, pitched around a pair of singles. But it looks at least in the early going like he's going to need every last one of them because Tommy Barnhouse has been masterful through two innings. Only one ball has been put in play. Couldn't ask for much more so far from Barnhouse. 
five strikeouts and six batters faced. And I think that is exactly what Mike Steele and his coaching staff were hoping for when they gave him the ball here this afternoon, trying to restore some confidence for Tommy a little bit after a couple of shaky outings at the back end of the bullpen. You get him going once again, it remains to see what role he could serve, but with his kind of stuff, you put him just about anywhere, he'll make a contribution. Garrett Kosas getting the start. And the first pitch to him misses one ball and no strikes. Kosas, three out of four, been limited to pinch hitting rolls before now. Got a hit yesterday. And he is an imposing figure in that batter's box. Big, strong left-hand batter. 6'4", 195 pounds. I was not 6'4", 195 pounds as a freshman. <laughs> I don't think we'll get there either, either one of us. Well, between he and Paxton Wallace and Hunter Gibson, Todd Butler's got some pieces to work with to kind of sprinkle into the lineup here and there. Got some pop off the bench if it comes to that later in the game, pinch hitting. So it's always nice to have options, and he's got a bunch of them. The future is bright with this trio for sure, and they will make an impact this season, no doubt about it, whether that's in a pinch hitting role or potentially as a DH too. Paxton Wallace has gotten the start there today and several times over the last couple games. And there was a time where we were wondering when we were going to see some of these freshmen consistently just because of all these veteran position players coming back for Wichita State. But they're starting to get sprinkled in here. And over the last week or so, they've all had their moments and contributions. Here's Boyer. Two strikeouts now for Lazaro. Boyer, three out of six, two doubles and a home run. So every hit that he's had in the series has gone for extra bases. He's also walked three times. The walks were maybe the most impressive thing yesterday. He ground out a couple of long at-bats in the seventh and eighth inning, including a 10-pitch walk and then followed it up with a seven-pitch walk in the eighth. He is just putting together some very good at-bats right now. Season's average now 262 after going three for six. It's been night and day, the difference between Wichita State and Furman offensively in this series. Shockers have 31 hits. Furman has eight. I mentioned Landon Kay is the only guy with more than one hit in the series. Shockers have seven guys with two or more, or actually nine guys with two or more hits in the series, and Garrett Kosas is one of them, and they were both pinch hit appearances. So Furman offense has absolutely been stuck in neutral. And Boyer goes down. 83 with some cutting action there from Lazaro working in on the hands of Jordan Boyer. Very nicely executed pitch, and not much a right-hand hitter can do with this, working to the back foot. Well, you talk about a sight for sore eyes. Matt Lazaro giving Brett Harker and pitching coach Caleb Davis exactly what they'd hoped, a guy that can command the strike zone, keep the shocker hitters off balance. We talked about it earlier in the series that part of the what makes a pitcher effective, we both agree, is pace. And Lazaro is not messing around out there. Tempo doesn't always have to be lightning quick, but just getting the ball and having a rhythm to it keeps the defense engaged, keeps everybody on their toes, and really just helps the game flow a lot better. Lazaro seems to have a nice rhythm to him. Every pitcher is going to have their own unique pace their own unique style and that doesn't mean everyone has to have like a cookie cutter approach to how they go about things but if you can be consistent with whatever you do you're going to typically find success well then you're not going to have people fall like you said people falling asleep behind you you want your defense 
as sharp as it could be. And if you're taking a tour of the mound in between every single pitch, then you're probably not going to help yourself much. Matt Lazaro strikes out the side in the second as we remain scoreless at the act. State University is Shocker Nation. We exceed expectations, push boundaries, seize opportunities, and move boldly ahead. We are student-centered and innovation-driven. It's who we are. Our vision is simple but powerful. Create, innovate, collaborate, and celebrate with one unifying purpose, to shock the world. Pitching's rule today to start with. Here in the final game of the series, Shockers looking for the sweep. Furman trying to salvage one on the Paladins' way out of town. Talked about Wichita State opening up American play next weekend at ECU. Samford is first up in the Southern for Furman after the Paladins take on Clemson on Tuesday. Six up and six down for Tommy Barnhouse. He's struck out five already. That's matched his career best last year against Valpo. It took him five innings, right, Denning, to do that? That's correct, yep. Matched his season high, and he's already got the five punch outs through two today. Good pace. <laughs> <laughs> Unsustainable, but we'll take it. One ball and no strikes. And again, the, to belabor the point, Wichita State's pitching staff is striking people out at a historic rate. Logan Taplett, catcher. Shockers entered this weekend just outside of the top 25 in terms of strikeouts per nine innings, and that's probably going to go up with their performance on Friday and yesterday. 25 combined punch outs through the first two games and Tommy Barnhouse keeping the theme at least in the early going. At the moment, 20 innings and 30 strikeouts for Shocker pitchers. Pretty ridiculous. And you combine that with the fact that they haven't walked many. Only 71 walks in 179 innings entering play today. A new career high in strikeouts for Tommy Barnhouse. Took him exactly seven batters. I was talking to Mike Steele, the pitching coach, this morning. And as you and I were joking, the, the one way to combat a kind of weird defensive alignment is strike everybody out. I, I mentioned the same thing to him. I said... I like your strategy, you know? <laughs> telling those guys to go out and strike people out. He laughed and said, uh, of course, he would like a few less walks, but honestly, when you have the swing and miss stuff, you can live with a few walks because the strikeouts just cover them up. So Mike Steele's got to be pretty proud. Second year pitching coach for the Shockers. Seems like every button that he's pushed so far has really worked. And the 71 walks is by no means bad either. It's just something I'm sure Mike Steele is wanting to, to clean up a little bit because there's always room for improvement. But if you look at, if you just compare it to the opponent's totals, opponents have walked shocker hitters almost 100 times this season in roughly the same amount of innings. So it's the swing and miss stuff combined with command that makes it really difficult to put together run scoring rallies against Wichita State right now. 
Well, in 20 games, 71 walks. What is that? Three and a half, roughly a roughly. game. Mm -hmm. I mean, 10.2, 10.3 strikeouts, and three and a half walks. It's a ratio you'll take every time. Now, Wichita State has hit far more batters than their opposition. We we've, we've discussed this in the past, how that's something that Mike Steele can live with because it means that you're working inside mm -hmm. and there's always going to be some danger to that. Troutwine picked that one up off the turf, two and two. Dylan Love is only three out of eight this year. This is his very first start. Still two and two. Yeah, we talked about it yesterday. Liam Eddy and Connor Lungwitz are the only guys on this team that have fewer than a strikeout per inning. Everybody else has struck out more than they have innings pitched. Barnhouse with his six strikeouts today now has 18 strikeouts and 12 and a third and only the two walks. He's always had good control. Last year, he only walked 14. So when you've got the pinpoint control and start to strike people out, that's a nice combo. And Vickers boots his first chance. So there's a base runner for Furman and the Shockers' first error of the series, I believe. And it comes from the guy you would probably least expect it. It just popped out of the glove. Looked like he had done everything right prior to receiving it. Got the feet set up. That's key on the backhand. You want to do the work early, get yourself in a position to make the throw. But sometimes you can take the eye off the ball for just a split second when you're trying to gather the sight line of first base. So here's the nine-hole hitter, Jabari Richards. Richards, one out of six in the series. Again, just eight base hits for Furman coming in to this game. One double, seven singles. Everything all the way across the board in the first two games, a stark contrast from Wichita State to Furman. All the way across. The Shockers, for example, have 10 extra base hits, six doubles and four homers. They're out slugging Furman in the series, 662 to 148. The only extra base hit is Brett Hebner's double. Hard to string together rallies, station to station, base by base. And Barnhouse makes his first mistake on 0-2 as Richards drills one in right field. So two on, one out, and back to the top of the order in Ben Anderson. Too much played here on nothing and two. Stayed elevated, too, and Jabari Richards didn't miss it, but that's something that the Shocker staff, too, the mentality has changed a little bit as far as how they approach. No ball, two strike counts. And Mike Steele has never been a big fan of waste pitches, really. He is fine with a purpose pitch, a fastball off the plate or elevated to set something else up, but doesn't seem like the kind of guy who will advocate just bouncing a breaking ball 58 feet just to do it. And so you will see some shocker pitchers give up hits on nothing and two because they are willing to be aggressive and willing to attack in those counts. Anderson struck out looking his first time up there and if you hadn't seen the first two games of the series, this is a guy that will look over some pitches, and I mean a lot of them. And it's hurt him in this particular series because the Shocker pitching staff has been in attack mode and had their good stuff. Anderson is 0 for 6 with four strikeouts. So the first bit of adversity for Tommy Barnhouse here in his first start of the year. 
Struck out six of the first seven guys he faced, and then Love reached on an error. And you can bet Trey Vickers is hoping for a ground ball to redeem himself here. Into right. Wind's not going to help him. Ritter started back, then comes on, and it drops. So Wichita State helping out Furman here in the third inning. Well, there's that odd defensive alignment that we were talking about. Ritter is kind of a, a utility guy, not a right fielder necessarily by trade. So now they're loaded on two balls that should have been handled, one by Vickers and one by Luke Ritter and Wright. It was a long run for Luke to be sure, but his angle to the baseball was probably not as efficient as it could have been. Started back and kind of rounded it off just a little bit. That proved to be the difference as Anderson placed it perfectly just inside the foul line and Furman threatening here in the third. Nice pick up by Garrett Kosas to salvage and out. Everybody moves up 90 feet. Hebner with an RBI, but Trey Vickers with a Really difficult play, and Garrett Kosas again getting his first start at first base. Made a nice pickup. Probably the only play there for Trey was first base. To try and get the force at second would have required turning his entire body to make the throw, and since Alec Bohm dove to try and cut that ball off, there was no chance to flip it to third. Yeah. So Trey doing a good job making a split second decision there, getting the sure out. And now Barnhouse can minimize the damage. Well, it's unfortunate because Tommy very easily could be out of the inning with really no trouble at all. So the Shockers find themselves trailing here in the final game of the series and I would imagine Matt Lazaro has the Shockers' full attention as he's gotten off to a good start on the mound for Furman, unlike his two predecessors. One more out to get, and a tough out in the person of Jake Crawford. Another good pick by Kosas. The Paladins got a gift run and they take the first lead of the series. Wichita State University is preparing today's students to become tomorrow's leaders. The Shock the World campaign is raising 25 million in private funds for a new home for the W. Frank Barton School on the Innovation Campus. Invest today in tomorrow's business leaders by calling 316-978-4076 or visit www.wichita.edu slash shock the world. Shockers find themselves trailing one to nothing. Unearned run in the top of the third. It'll be Travis Young and back to the top of the order against Matt Lazaro who's been very effective in his first couple innings, Denny. Attacking the strike zone and that's been kind of a departure from Furman pitching through the first two games of this series. Lazaro, as we mentioned, doesn't walk anybody. Only four free passes now in 31 innings. He struck out the side in the second and seems to have command of several different offerings. It's presenting problems here in the early going. 
Furman pitchers before today in this series had allowed 29 hits and 12 walks in 16 innings. Shockers were hitting 408 in the first two games. And they're only struck out seven times. They've already struck out four times against Lozaro today. Young tries to bunt, and this is going to be trouble. Safe at first. Good idea and a good execution. A little push bunt by Travis Young. He's on there. Travis will usually try this at least once a game when he's in the starting lineup. He's been dragging it towards third as of late, but this time with the lefty on the mound, pushes it right up the first baseline, and you knew right off the bat there was going to be very little chance for Lazaro. He would have had to come up with a very athletic pick and flip, and he couldn't do it as Travis beats it out. And Ritter shoots one into left field for a base hit, so the Shockers come right back with singles on consecutive pitches. I was just getting ready to say, Denning, that with Young over at first base, and I suppose it still applies with him at second. This combination between Lazaro and Taplet, they've only permitted, oh, 85, 86% opposing base stealers success rate. <laughs> we R could very well see these two on the move at some point in the at-bat here with Vickers. Something Wichita State might try here is uh, the show bunt, pull it back, double steal. That b would be an aggressive play, but these are the three guys who might try it. So to get Crawford creeping in a little bit and then steal him blind behind him, huh? Looks like Furman is expecting a bunt. They've got Elmy in in front of the bag at first, Crawford in a step or two at third. So when you've got that in the back of the mind, it can at least present itself as an option. One and one to Trey Vickers. Yeah, Taplet behind home plate has thrown thrown out five of 32 trying to steal. That is about 16%. And six of seven that have tried against Lazaro have made it. That's right around 86% success rate. So Shockers get the proper guys on. Might see them try to take off. They're not a big base stealing team overall. And that little flare is going to drop into right field. Shockers are really in business now. They'll have them loaded. And they've loaded them up a lot this year. Oh, wouldn't you know it? Alec Bohm's coming up. It's a good guy to have up there. How about this piece of hitting from Trey Vickers? Gets jammed, muscles it into short right field. That is something he has done so well in his Wichita State career. Typically, he does it. With two strikes, you'll see a breaking ball and just kind of flick it towards right center. This time, uh, almost an emergency swing there on one and one, but still had the strength to dump it in front of K. So here's Bohm, the owner of three grand slams already this year. That's tops in the nation. And Lozaro is going to work out a full windup, which is a little interesting. It means all three runners are going to get very big leads, very big secondaries. Lazaro has permitted five homers in his first five starts. Don't see an east wind here at X Stadium very often, but that's what we have here today. Blowing directly in from right field. Shockers had Two sacrifice flies last year. You see the win. Two sacrifice flies yesterday with bases loaded. Vickers had one of them. That was a pitch to handle, and all Bohm could do is foul it back. One and two. A lot of soft stuff so far from Lazaro in this at bat. And that 78 mile an hour changeup, I think, stayed elevated and in a hittable spot. Bohm would love to have that one back. Bohm, five hits in the series, singled his first time up there. Two and two. This is the pitch Lazaro wants to do it on, for sure. You get yourself into three and two with bases loaded, nobody out against Alec Bohm, you're asking for trouble. So this is the pitch Lazaro wants some action on. Yeah. 
Well, he wanted him to bite on a changeup, and Alec wouldn't do it. For all the things that Alec has done well offensively, with the obviously the extra base hit power, he's only struck out eight times in 74 at bats. Excellent for a guy that produces as many runs as he does. Three and two. So Alec Bohm brings in a run with the bases loaded, but not how you would think. Four consecutive have reached here in the third. Bases remain loaded. Bohm gets his 22nd run batted in. His fourth RBI of the series, and here's Paxton Wallace. Wonder if maybe the reputation of Bohm kind of preceded him in that. I would say. Because Lazaro got ahead one and two and then didn't throw anything close. Tried to get him to expand his strike zone, and Bohm is just not the kind of guy to do it. <laughs> Statistically, a bases loaded walk to Bohm is actually a good play Percent so far this gotta year. Got to play the percentages. You That's know, right. You gotta there was a base open there. And now, after really cutting through the shocker offense in the first two innings, Matt Lazaro has run into a bit of trouble here in the third. His guys got him an unearned run in the top of the inning, but then a bunt single by Young, a first pitch single to left by Ritter, and Vickers dumped one into right field to load him up. And as Denning mentioned, Lazaro got ahead of Bohm but couldn't put him away. And now he's in a dangerous spot here, falling behind Paxton Wallace. Looks like the pitching coach, Caleb Davis, talking to his freshman. The Furman offense may come to Rue the top half of that third inning. And they had bases loaded one out, two and three hitters coming up. And all Hebner and Crawford could produce is a couple of bouncers to short. One did score the run, but considering how few offensive chances that the Paladins have had in this series, to have three on with two of your best hitters due up, and that's all you get out of it, a little frustrating to say the least. You can say it. They need a crooked number there bad. Only getting one, you're right. They may really regret that. That's in there, one and one. Decent speed on the bases all the way around. Paladin infield looking for a ground ball double play. And they got it. So if Wichita State only ends up getting two out of this. I think Furman could probably feel pretty good about that. Mound visit pays immediate dividends for sure as Lazaro came back with two good pitches. Gets Wallace to bounce into the traditional 6-4-3. Made it a very close play here at first as he stretched out at the last second, but that throw from Love got him by a half step. Troutwine lined out to end the first. His first time up there. He's got a runner at third and two away with two home in the inning. Gunner working on a good series, three out of seven. We mentioned the two home runs. One thing that Troutwine has done, Denning talked about his resurgence offensively this year compared to last. Is cut down on the strikeouts. He struck out quite a bit last year, but only once in every old oh, five and a half, six times up there this year. And his walks are up too. He's walked almost as much as he struck out. So you'll take that ratio every time from a guy with as much power as he has. Well, he seems to have a plan this year, Shane. I think that's the biggest difference that stands out to me is that he is looking for his pitch rather than trying to make adjustments in every count. And it's been a big difference for him. He's gotten pitches to drive. And he's been ready for him, put good swings on baseballs. Shocker's got three singles and a walk here in the third. That one a little upstairs, two and two. And we may have seen the last of Tommy Barnhouse, too, in his first start of the year. He went three strong. Off the end of the bat, shallow right. This is trouble. And running it down is K to end the shocker second. But Wichita State takes the lead.
Charles Koch Arena is the place where we gather as a community to compete against the very best. Now our game plan is to renovate Koch Arena by adding a new student athlete success center. Your tax deductible gift can help deliver that slam dunk. Join us at the level that is right for you. Donate online at wichita.edu slash shock the world. A Barnhouse back for a little bit more. Whether he gets the whole inning or not, or not will remain to be seen, but three plus is what's on tap for Tommy Barnhouse, who has given up two singles, struck out six, and one unearned run. No walk so far. That's been key as well. Not much to complain about through the first three innings for Tommy Barnhouse. He did a good job of minimizing the damage in that third inning, allowing just the one unearned run. And as he continues to make his way through the order for a second time, I imagine the bullpen will be on high alert in case he should happen to run into any trouble. And now that he's the second time through the order, we'll see how much of his repertoire will expand. That is to say, will the he mix in any change-ups because he's basically been fastball slider guy to the Paladin lineup the first time through. This trio in the second went fly ball, strikeout, strikeout, starting with Brandon Elmy. Elmy, one out of four yesterday. Barnhouse done an excellent job getting ahead in counts. Elmi's another one of these guys alongside Kay who the Paladins need to get going. 341 led the team last year, and another guy who had 11 home runs and 49 RBI. Hasn't put it together yet this season. Falling behind, nothing in two. Elmi does have 12 extra base hits of his 22, so he is plenty dangerous, but just one out of five so far in the series. He did not play in the opener Friday. Boy, the pitching staff for the Shockers really stuck it to Furman. 11 to one, limiting them to two hits. One and two to Brandon Elmy, native of Venice, Florida, senior. Two and two. Furman University, Greenville, South Carolina. The oldest private institution of higher learning in the state. Been around since 1826. And they actually started playing baseball not all that long after that. This is 117th season of Furman baseball. Established 1891. Barnhouse has another strikeout. One down in the fourth. Climbing the ladder a little bit. Tommy Barnhouse had worked away after he got ahead of Elmy nothing and two a couple of times. And Looked like Troutline was set up down and away. This pitch leaks back to the inner third. Tommy didn't look particularly pleased with himself, but a strikeout is a strikeout. Yeah. Nope. Hang your head. Walk around like you meant to do it. <laughs> I don't know the difference. <laughs> Here's Landon Kay. He struck out his first time up. There have been a lot of strikeouts in baseball history on bad pitches. Cement mixer sliders yep. that just stayed on the inner part of the plate. Hanging breaking balls when they're looking fastball. Look, hitting is hard, and pitches don't have to be great to get swung on and miss. And every once in a while, honestly, even if it's not meant to be a high fastball, just throw it as hard as you can every now and then. Just yeah. see what it does. Yeah, just yeah. see what happens. K's down in the count 0-2. We'd be great pitching coaches. <laughs> Yeah, hey guys, every just, once in a while would be great pitching coaches. Eat. <laughs> yeah, that wouldn't work all the time. 
It sounds like, though, that that philosophy hasn't been far off somewhat from what Mike Steele has told a couple of mm -hmm. these guys, where at times they've looked a little tentative out on the mound. And we heard the example with Keelan Kilgore, where he just told them, go out, throw it as hard as you can. Yeah. Find another gear out there. Yeah, it's one thing to want to have good mechanics and certainly don't want to downplay mechanics. It's a big part of pitching, but every once in a while it's about being athletic and trying to throw it through the glove and not to the glove, stuff like that. So, Intent yeah. is a big part of it. Still 0-2 to Landon K. Another strikeout as K is punched out again. So he's now two out of eight with five strikeouts in this series. That's eight strikeouts for Barnhouse. That shatters his previous high in his career. Trent Alley was a strikeout victim his first time up there. And Shocker pitchers keep piling up the Ks. Thirty-three strikeouts for Shocker pitchers in this series. It's a minor miracle that he struck out as many guys that he has in only 57 pitches. I mean, there's been more than a handful that have only been three or four pitch strikeouts. And this is just a real cursory glance back at the scorebook from the last two days, but it Upon first check, it appears as though Furman has only had one inning this weekend where they haven't struck out. How about that? <laughs> a little ground ball to second, and Barnhouse has a very, very easy fourth inning. Shockers lead 2-1 to one going to the bottom of the fourth. Wichita State University is preparing today's students to become tomorrow's leaders. The Shock the World campaign is raising $25 million in private funds for a new home for the W. Frank Barton School on the Innovation Campus. Invest today in tomorrow's business leaders by calling 316-978-4076 or visit www.wichita.edu slash shock the world. All the runs came in the fourth inning. Furman's run was unearned. Shockers put the first four guys on, but a double play short-circuited that rally. That's why we're where we are. Two to one, Garrett Kosas will lead it off. Shocker Sports Grill and Lanes is a perfect place to spend time with family and friends. Open to the public, the Shocker Sports Grill and Lanes feature eight bowling lanes, billiards tables, Great food, beverages, like freshly made burgers, sandwiches, salads, cold beer, and more. Shocker Sports Grill and Lanes, located in the lower level of the Radigan Student Center. The perfect place for kids' birthday parties, too. Kosa's strikeout victim, his first time up there, getting his first start for the Shockers. He gives May, uh, Mason O'Brien the day off. So a couple of the mainstays, Denning, in the Shocker lineup through the first 20 games, getting the day off, or at least to start with, Grayson Genesta, Mason O'Brien. And a somewhat tough assignment for Kosas, too, here in getting the start, facing a lefty. I'm not opposed to sitting Mason for these last two games at all. He has had to battle some injury history in his collegiate career at Cali and Oklahoma State. And so giving him a couple days to rest against some tough lefties, not a bad idea. Unfortunately for Garrett Kosas, he gets stuck with a very tough matchup. A little bit of a baptism by fire for him. And he's been struck out twice on pitches just like that. So one away, and here's Boyer. He struck out his first time up there. 
And Kosas is going to learn that scouting reports on you will get out really quick. And even through four at-bats, if you're three for four, people are going to start to take notice. And now that he has seen that fastball away, strike him out a couple of times, he's probably going to keep seeing it until he makes an adjustment. I think one to Jordan Boyer has moved up in the lineup yesterday and today. Lazaro just had a little bit of a hiccup in the third inning. Otherwise, he's been really good. And really, even though he gave up the two runs in that third inning, the beginning of the inning, hardly his fault. First pitch was a bunt single by Travis Young. The second pitch was a ground ball single to left. So he was just trying to get ahead of the hitters, and Young and Ritter took advantage. And then Vickers single is just kind of an inside out flare into shallow right. Not much that Lazaro could do about any of those. The one he will regret, I think, is the walk to Bohm, where he had him one and two, and then maybe just didn't be aggressive enough, I think. Tried to get him to expand the zone three times, and none of the pitches were particularly tempting. Boyer hooks one to left field for a base hit. We'll see if he tries to stretch it for two. A huge turn and thought better of it, and wisely so. So Boyer holds on with a long single. Now DeBacker, who struck out looking his first time up there. That is Wichita State's sixth hit, but they've all been singles. Jordan Boyer continues his hot series. That's now four hits for him on the weekend. Been impressed with the play of Richards in left field. He's done this a couple of times where he's cut balls off and held jockers to long singles. Did it once on Genesee yesterday, ranging towards the gap in left center, this time towards the line, and made a nice strong throw in to hold Jordan at first. Josh DeBacker still looking for his first hit of the year. He is now 0 for 8. This is start number 2 for him. Runner goes. And they're still going to turn the double play. No, safe at first. That was bang, bang at first. A hit and run that almost turned into a double play anyway. And almost turned into first and second one out. It was a bang, bang play at second. And if Boyer had been ruled safe, yep. DeBacker would have beat out the return throw. There was just a split-second hesitation here from Love as to what he wanted to do with it. And his shuffle didn't have a whole lot behind it. Kind of a lead balloon over to Hebner. And he kind of double-clutched it to the beginning. So here's Young. Bunt single that we told you about a moment ago. That was to start last inning. They got DeBacker and guessed right. And that's that for Wichita State in the fourth. State University is Shocker Nation. We exceed expectations, push boundaries, seize opportunities, and move boldly ahead. We are student-centered and innovation-driven. It's who we are. Our vision is simple but powerful. Create, innovate, collaborate, and celebrate with one unifying purpose, to shock the world. Connor Lugwitz takes over on the mound for Wichita State after Tommy Barnhouse 
initial start of the season. Went four innings, struck out eight, gave up one unearned run. So Mike Steele definitely knew what he was talking about when he ran Barnhouse out there, who was his opening day closer. Too enthusiastic thumbs up from this unbiased observer. I'd say so. Tommy Barnhouse had the good stuff all day. Eight punch outs for him and four innings. I think all you can ask from a guy who wasn't particularly stretched out as well. He kept the Shockers in the ball game, leaves with a lead, and now turns it over to the guy who had been the normal Sunday starter in Connor Lungwitz. Lungwitz making his second relief appearance of the week. Two and two thirds scoreless innings against Oklahoma, backing up Alex Siegel in Alex's first start of the year. So Connor, you saw his numbers earlier, appearing for the sixth time, 1-0 and ERA of about three and a half. So they get four out of Tommy Barnhouse, no walks, and that career high eight strikeouts. Lungwitz will get the lower third of the order. It'll be Taplett, Love, and Richards do up to face him. All the scoring coming in the third. Paladin's got a run. The Shockers got two, and here we are. Connor had alternated bad starts with good ones, starting opening weekend against McNeese State. Didn't make it out of the third inning. And then went six shutout against Omaha in the Shockers' opening series. He pours a strike in there to Taplett. Then he struggled a little against Nebraska and then went five stellar innings against Texas Arlington and then backed it up with that midweek relief outing against OU. He saw good Connor Lungwitz against Oklahoma. He had that big roundhouse curveball working effectively, throwing it for strikes, using it as a put-away pitch as well, and moving the fastball to both sides of the plate. Bohm waits on the hop, crow hop, and gets Taplet one away. So a good start for Lungwitz. It's a ground ball out. That'll bring up Dylan Love. He scored the Paladins' only run so far. Bohm has shown off the arm a couple of times this year. He's got a strong one. And it is a nice luxury to know you can wait back to get a hop that you're looking for when you got a cannon over at third base. And I think he continues to answer questions about whether he can play third base at the next level. Absolutely. I don't know that he's ever been a below average or quote unquote bad third baseman. He came in doggedly wanting to play third. I mean, he didn't he didn't want to move. He wanted to be a third baseman. Love lazy fly ball to right. But in each of his three years here, He's gotten progressively better. His range is deceptively good. Of course, when you're big like that, you would assume you can cover some ground, but that's <laughs> not necessarily the case. <laughs> you just already cover a lot of ground as a big person. Yeah. But I think there was a brief flirtation with moving him to first base just to ensure that his bat was going to stay in the lineup. And with his size, you like having a big target over there at first. But his hands have improved, his range has improved, and he's always had the strong arm. So no real reason to move him at this point. Bohm's made two errors this year. And honestly, I can't remember either one of them. That tells you how solid he's been. That double play he turned on Friday. Oh, with, man. With the quick flip to second after ranging all the way over towards the six hole. You combine that with the way he's been swinging the bat. Scouts are going to be flocking. Yeah, he raised his eyebrows enough the way it is, but... He played defense like he has. Lungwitz gets back in the count, two and one. Connor's going to be 85-87 with the fastball, and so it's imperative that he is hitting spots, working to both sides of the plate, has a little two-seam run to it when he wants to. One flipped into left, and DeBacker makes a nice diving catch. And saves a 1-2-3 inning for Connor Lungwitz. Halfway through, the Shockers are up one, trying to get the sweep. Wichita State University is preparing today's students to become tomorrow's leaders. 
The Shock the World campaign is raising $25 million in private funds for a new home for the W. Frank Barton School on the Innovation Campus. Invest today in tomorrow's business leaders by calling 316-978-4076 or visit www.wichita.edu slash shock the world. Matt Lazaro's had a pretty easy time of it through the first four innings, worked out of a early jam in the third. And considering the way that inning was going, the fact that he only gave up the two runs was a pretty good thing for him. He'll get nine, one, and two. Travis Young was up there when Josh DeBacker was picked off. So it'll be Young then back to the top of the order. So this will be the third look at Matt Lazaro once we get back to the top of the order. And these were the guys who started that rally. Young bunted his way on in the third and is liable to do so again if he feels like the defense hasn't made an adjustment. It looks like the Paladins are going to bring the corners in to protect against just that, but there's a whole bunch of benefits to just squaring around. Brings the corners in, gives you a chance to yank a ground ball by somebody, and Travis certainly has the ability to do that. We'll shoot one the other way, pass the drawn in first baseman. So, bun or not, just showing it as its benefits. Young got his average up to 222, and he jerks one down the left field line and deep, but that's hooking foul. Boy, that was a tracer. Young made a bid to become the newest shocker to hit a home run this season. There are only a couple that have gotten multiple ABs not to leave the yard so far for the Shockers this year. 11 different Shockers have homered and Young almost made it an even dozen. He's had two in each of his first two seasons here. So you'd like to think at some point this year he's going to run into one. Lazaro hadn't made very many mistakes. But he survived one two pitches ago. And now Young just trying to put it in play. Use his speed. Put it in play he does, but he hit it too hard right at the shortstop. So Travis one out of two and now back to the top and Ritter. Berman probably couldn't be happier with what Matt Lazaro has given him through the first four plus considering what they got from Sherman yesterday. We thought that Verbeck was pretty solid on Friday. Got the short end of the stick just a little bit, but his pitching staff was in dire straits heading into the ball game today and needed this kind of performance. Yeah, they still got a couple of statistically good looking relievers that they haven't gone to yet. So the Shockers doing all they can to try to stay ahead of Furman before they turn it over to some of their better relievers. Ritter is flied to center and single to left. Tyler Kimbrell's the one we haven't yep. seen who has been the closer for him. Long drive to left center and Anderson runs it down on the track. Ritter gave it a ride, but he is out number two here in the fifth, two up and two down. More good swings from Luke Ritter today. Base hit his last time up, and this time pounds it to the deepest part of the ballpark. Anderson got a good jump on it, though, and has some good speed to track it down. Wind helped it a little, but not quite enough. Vickers trying for a three-hit game. He singled in the first and the third. He is now nine for 27. Missed the first three weeks of the season due to a hamstring issue. Yeah. 
And he's the kind of guy that will give Matt Lazaro problems because he rarely overswings. Lazaro's hoping you will get yourself out. But Vickers most times stays in control and inside the ball, as they call it. One and two. Well, the wind was blowing out to left Friday, over toward the right field corner yesterday, and now in from right and over toward the left field corner a little bit more now as the wind is out of the east-southeast, straight in from the east, first couple of innings. No consistency in the weather in Kansas? What? No. That's ridiculous. No kidding. Three and two to Trey. The wind I don't care as much about, as long as the temperature's up above oh, 55, 57 degrees. You can deal with the wind after that. Temperatures are going to be a little different for conference play this year than we've been used to in the past. Nothing against normal Illinois and <laughs> Evansville, Indiana, but trips to South Florida and Central Florida won't be half bad. Houston liable to be warm in Houston. Started looking ahead to the long range forecast for the ECU trip. Not too bad as well. 79 degrees and partly sunny on Thursday afternoon slash That'll play. evening. That'll yeah. play. Send me a postcard. Conway, Arkansas, a little different. You won't need one from there. A bunch of clouds and rain on Tuesday. Go, oh, well, keep our fingers crossed. One, two, three inning for Lazaro. That's his second one turned in. We remain in a two to one game. Charles Koch Arena is the place where we gather as a community to compete against the very best. Now our game plan is to renovate Koch Arena by adding a new student athlete success center. Your tax deductible gift can help deliver that slam dunk. Join us at the level that is right for you. Donate online at wichita.edu slash shock the world. Move to the top of the sixth inning. Connor Lungwitz will get the top of the order for the Furman Paladins. It'll be Anderson, Hebner, and Crawford due up against the big right-hander, junior from Mays High School. Connor, in the 2015 draft, was taken in the 35th round by the Tigers. Last year, pitched almost exclusively out of the pen. His freshman year, there's Connor's vitals for you. He made five starts in eight appearances his freshman season. The coaching staff wasn't sold that he was completely 100% healthy either, but he's turned out to be a valuable member of this pitching staff and kind of a however you need him kind of role. A couple of innings in relief, like we mentioned earlier in the week against OU. But he's also made a handful of starts this year as well. Top of the order. You mentioned how Connor got drafted, but that was just one of a couple of different decisions that he had to make after wrapping up his high school career at Mays. He had some low-level college football offers. He was an outstanding quarterback at Mays. So could have gone to play professional baseball, could have gone to play college football, and instead elected to stay home and pitch for the Shockers. Yeah, football is fun and all, but I gotta believe he made the right decision playing baseball. 
quality of life sure. <laughs> down the line. Of course, you're not thinking about that too much when you're 17 or 18, but play baseball instead of a collision sport. I'll take that. So long which falls behind for the first time in a while for a shocker pitcher. Activity still going down in the Wichita State pen in case Lungwitz runs into trouble. Just loosening up now is Clayton McGinnis. You think back to that Friday game, it was an 11-1 final, but it was about like this in mid-game. Shockers lead this one 2-1. to one. It was 3-1 to one after 5.5 on Friday. And then the Shockers took advantage of a tiring Nick Verbeck, and then they poured it on Jake Crawford, who came in to pitch. Ben Anderson has had better weekends. Anderson strikes out again, and that's how the sixth inning starts. It's nine strikeouts now for Shocker pitching and a backdoor breaking ball that he could have done nothing with. Gave up on it as it came back to the outside part of the plate. Anderson, we know he is content to not swing the bat in two strike counts. If you can throw it for a strike, you're going to have some success against him. He has put himself into some bad spots. Really and shocker has. pitchers have taken advantage. Really has. So one away for Hebner, 0 for 2 today. Brad is now 1 for 9 in the series. Well, it took them into the sixth inning before they got their first hit Friday, and they had to settle for two. They were stuck on two yesterday for a long time until the eighth inning rolled around, and they racked up a few. They ended up with six hits yesterday, but only two more today. That one bounced over the mound. Boyer's got to hurry. Kosas bails him out. Eric Kosas flashing the leather over at first base today has made a couple of very nice scoops and that's a great job by Jordan Boyer recognizing he had to get rid of that in a hurry and if you can just put it on target give your big first baseman a chance to make the scoop. Kosas of course with this being his first start at first base was out here very very early taking ground balls throws fungos from shortstop you name it he saw baseballs from every angle. He's had a couple of tests where he's had to dig them out of the turf. Jordan Boyer made it look so easy there yesterday. He did. <laughs> he did. Kosa said, give me a glove. <laughs> Jake Crawford's struck out and grounded short. So the Shocker pitching staff trying to Hold the Paladins down until the offense comes around today. It's been tough going against Matt Lazaro. Lazaro's been sharp. A couple of one, two, three innings. Had five strikeouts. And just the one walk, although it came with bases loaded. In the air to right, Ritter. Settles under it, and Connor Lungwitz, face six, retired six, out of the shocker pin. Wichita State University is preparing today's students to become tomorrow's leaders. The Shock the World campaign is raising $25 million in private funds for a new home for the W. Frank Barton School on the Innovation Campus. Invest today in tomorrow's business leaders by calling 316-978-4076 or visit www.wichita.edu slash shock the world.
Fell through five and a half. Two of the three games of the series have been just like this. Pitcher's duels. Jacques getting the better of Matt Lazaro, at least so far. They'll send three, four, and five in the order here in the bottom of the sixth inning. Attention, Shocker fans. You want to shop the largest selection of Shocker merchandise at the official bookstore of WSU, University Bookstore, located on the first floor of the Radigan Student Center on the campus of Wichita State or online 24-7 at wsubooks.com. Find everything you need for every generation of Shocker Nation. Join our Shocker Rewards program, too, for cash back on future purchases. University Bookstore, place to shop. And I would imagine if we keep this up, University Bookstore is going to be doling out some Shocker baseball garb. 16 and 4. Again, if they win today and beat Central Arkansas Tuesday, they would match their best start in 13 years. 2005 team started at 18 and 4. That'll get people's attention. For sure. So will the RPI. And that's right where Shockers want it at the moment, too. Two and one to Bohm. What are we looking at? Seven? Seven and right D1 there? baseball's RPI. Haven't checked Warren Nolan's yet this afternoon, but the Shockers came in to play this weekend in the top ten in that as well. Three and one. Boy, Bohm just won't chase a pitch out of the zone very often. He just... Doesn't get himself out. He does not. And that's a hard guy to pitch to when he does damage on his pitches and doesn't swing at anything other than his pitches. Let that one go. Called strike. Three and two. Yeah, he now has 74 at bats in addition to 17 walks and has only struck out eight times. This one may stay in. Elmi makes the play. So Bohm, a, a rare non-line drive, especially in this series. Here's Paxton Wallace. Again, if you're just joining us, Dayton Duga out of the lineup, Grayson Genesta out of the lineup, both for what we can assume are minor injuries because they were both in an original copy of the starting lineup that was later changed. But either way, this nine for Wichita State holding a tenuous two to one lead. Paxton Wallace, 0 for two. His double play was probably the biggest half bat in the game so far. If he puts it through the left side instead of right at the shortstop, we've got ourselves a different ball game right now. Two away. <laughs> Meanwhile, Tommy Barnhouse and Connor Lungwitz have teamed up on a two hitter through the first six innings. And will two stand up today. Shockers are going to go in order for the second straight game. To the seventh we go in a two to one contest. State University is Shocker Nation. We exceed expectations, push boundaries, seize opportunities, and move boldly ahead. We are student-centered and innovation-driven. It's who we are. Our vision is simple but powerful. Create, innovate, collaborate, and celebrate with one unifying purpose 
to shock the world. Been two to one since the third inning. Paladins got their only run after Dylan Love with one out reached on an error by Trey Vickers. Well, Shockers haven't gotten much more going. They loaded them up in the third. Got a bases loaded walk to make it one to one. And then as Denning mentioned in the last half inning, Paxson Wallace with a pivotal at bat of the day, grounded into a double play. It brought in a run. And that's been the difference so far, Mason O'Brien. There you see him take over for Garrett Kosas, who got the start at first. So we get a little more accomplished first baseman now that we're getting to the latter innings. Connor Lungwitz has thrown two perfect innings in relief of Tommy Barnhouse. That's right, Tommy Barnhouse started today. And all he did was strike out eight in four innings. So here we go to the seventh. Brandon Elmy. Landon Kay and Trent Alley, the scheduled hitters. A little bit of a delay before Elmy climbs in there, so here we go. The last three guys that Lungwitz hadn't faced yet today. Under Troutwine having some trouble, I think, with the pitch calling sleeve on his arm and not sure I think Wichita State alternates those cards as to which pitches are going to be used in what sequence and so you got to have the right one on or else you're going to have some cross-ups happened one other time in this series if memory serves that he either had trouble getting it on his arm or got the improper one but sooner or later we're going to throw a pitch here in the seventh inning Was the right call, 0-1-1. What's the sign for that one? Just throw that. <laughs> Serve it up. <laughs> Back in the day when, I don't know, a handful of major league managers had some influence on what their pitchers would throw. Roger Craig was a San Francisco Giants manager back in the 80s and pitching coach as well. And when the catcher would look over to Roger Craig and find out what Roger wanted his pitchers to throw, he'd either have his hand on the heater, which meant it was a fastball, <laughs> or in his lap, <laughs> meaning off speed. That's it. Who needs all these there, complicated No wristbands, signals. no signals. And a line drive right to the center fielder. Elmy, a tough luck out, number one. Well, as long as we're throwing stories around, back in my high school career, we played Nickerson High School once. And their version of signs, they had created a language. It was completely made up words that wow. they would use to convey signals. And most of the time, it was when they were hitting rather than pitching. But it would just be gibberish to everyone else and convey some sort of meaning to the hitter. So instead of wiping across the sleeve or the cap or the back of the head, it was hobble, wobble, bobble, jobble. Uh -huh. Something to that effect. K is yet to put it in play. Had a pitcher in the mid-90s, and a very good one, too, Mike Brandley, left-hander that pitched here. Had trouble seeing the signs. Had trouble seeing the, the fingers by the catcher. And finally, Doug Mirabelli, as good of a catcher as he was, after exhausting every other option, would decide, and Brandley was a fastball changeup guy anyway, really didn't have much of a breaking ball or mess around with one. So Doug would put his catcher's glove on his knee for a fastball or in front of his knee and just let it hang a little bit if he wanted to throw a changeup. So whatever the signals that he was flashing, Brantley couldn't see anyway, so all Brantley was looking at was his glove. Where's Doug's glove? That's what I'm going to throw. 
little bit high, and there's the first walk issued by Shocker pitching today. Didn't miss by much from Connor Longwitz, but that may spell the end for him. As that 3-1 pitch must have missed a little up, perhaps a little in as well, and Furman with the potential tying run aboard. So Trent Alley, who's also 0 for 2, is due up. And Clayton McGinnis is due in out of the Shocker bullpen. So Lungwitz pitches two and a third, but we'll turn it over to Clayton McGinnis when we come back. Wichita State University is preparing today's students to become tomorrow's leaders. The Shock the World campaign is raising $25 million in private funds for a new home for the W. Frank Barton School on the Innovation Campus. Invest today in tomorrow's business leaders by calling 316-978-4076 or visit www.wichita.edu slash shock the world. Clayton McGinnis has been the busiest shocker pitcher this year. 1 and 0 with an ERA of 203. And this is his 14th game already. He's allowed fewer base runners than innings pitch, which is always ideal, especially when he comes in in situations like this with a inherited runner. There you see the strikeouts to walks very good, certainly the strikeouts to innings pitched. His facial hair also good. Looks <laughs> like the son of Doc Holliday or a spinoff thereof. So he's got it all going on this season. Clayton McGinnis, the native of Missouri. These are the kind of situations where he was used a lot last year when he would come on in the middle of innings to try and put out fires, particularly against right handed hitters. And he'll get a couple of chances to do that here with Allie and Taplet due up. And last year, he was an absolute situational guy, like just one batter at a time. 21 appearances, 11 and two-thirds innings. That was McGinnis last year. But again, this year, he seems to really relish coming in and facing the opponents with guys on base. Been very good at it. Trent Alley is 0 for 9 in the series. After 0 for 2 today, he is now 2 for 14 this year. Might be 2. And they're going to say out on the transfer and Landon K with a very ill-advised head first slide into second base. Why you would do that trying to break up a double play, I don't know, but Paladin's actually pretty fortunate that it didn't turn into two there. Alec Bohm did the tricky part. Yep. With that in-between hop, made an accurate throw down to Boyer, but I have no idea what Kay is doing there. That's a good way to get yourself yeah, hurt. You should never do that unless you're maybe, maybe, if you're stealing second base, but otherwise, no. So Taplet gets... And at bat save for him since the Shockers couldn't turn it. Good strike in there, nothing in one. That'll close the book on Connor Lungwitz as well. Two and a third scoreless innings for him. Another good outing out of the Shocker pen. Well, that bullpen has really, really been solid this year. You know, another thing, Denning, that we, we have not brought up stats wise and there are very few of them that we haven't touched on that have been so good this year hits per nine innings barely over six for the staff 6.44 hits per nine that would be a program best if the season ended today and McGinnis puts out the fire again 
Shockers looking for some insurance stretch time here at the Eck. Charles Koch Arena is the place where we gather as a community to compete against the very best. Now our game plan is to renovate Koch Arena by adding a new student athlete success center. Your tax deductible gift can help deliver that slam dunk. Join us at the level that is right for you. Donate online at wichita.edu slash shock the world. Matt Lazaro has twice gone seven innings this year. He was really good against Michigan State. Give up one run, four hits and in seven innings. Didn't walk anybody, struck out eight. It's that kind of Matt Lazaro that the Shockers are seeing today. They got the best of him so far, if you want to put it that way. They're leading two to one, but that's about all you can say. A little bit of action down in the Furman bullpen. Heath Hawkins loosening just in case, but so far Lazaro's been pretty good. He's had two outings of seven innings this year, and they were pretty much polar opposites against yep. Central Connecticut State. Allowed the 12 hits and nine runs in seven innings, and as you mentioned, was pretty dominant against Michigan State. Eight strikeouts, only four hits in the one run. It has been the latter this afternoon. Mason O'Brien will get his first plate appearance after replacing Garrett Kosas after Garrett got his first start over at first base. Shockers have been limited to six hits, but Furman only has two. They've gone two, six, and two in the hit department. Shockers trying to add on here in the late stages. O'Brien blowing on this one, hoping it gets out of play, and it does. Crawford uh, running in the wall, maybe <laughs> a little bit faster than I think he would have liked. He or the wall didn't, up. didn't give as much as he hoped it would. It always looks so cool on the highlight yeah. reels when you lean over the wall, fall over it, and make a catch, but... It's still a wall, and <laughs> those are still hurt. ribs. <laughs> O'Brien in the left center. Richards has it peel back toward him, and he makes the play. So one out in the seventh. Shockers continue to struggle to get things going against Matt Lazaro. Boyer's had a hit in two trips. I don't want to necessarily call this a makeshift lineup, but it kind of was. You know, Josh DeBacker doesn't start all that often in left. Travis Young doesn't start all that often in center. Fact remains, they haven't squared up many balls against Matt Lazaro. That's nine in a row set down by the pallet and lefty. Two away. And over that stretch of nine, basically Vickers' sharp ground ball to short, the only one that you could describe yep. as a, a loud out. Maybe Ritter's fly into center field that pushed Anderson to the warning track, but not much to speak of offensively since the third. And Wichita State maybe regretting that they couldn't push more than two across. Eight, nine, and one due up for the Paladins in the eighth. Three more scoreless innings in relief from the Shocker bullpen. Got more than they could have hoped, I would think, from Tommy Barnhouse getting the start here today. Went four and gave up just one run. It was unearned. Here's DeBacker, who's struck out and grounded out. Tries to bunny his way on on pitch number 91. 
And Lazaro is up for the task. Three innings in a row where the Shockers have gone down one, two, three. Wichita State University is preparing today's students to become tomorrow's leaders. The Shock the World campaign is raising $25 million in private funds for a new home for the W. Frank Barton School on the Innovation Campus. Invest today in tomorrow's business leaders by calling 316-978-4076 or visit www.wichita.edu slash shock the world. But Cody Tyler will face potentially two left-hand batters here in the eighth inning. It'll be Dylan Love, then Richards and Anderson, lefties scheduled. Here's the Paladins down to their final six outs, try to avoid the sweep. Cody Tyler in there for the sixth time this year, as you see there, all in relief. Only walked one, struck out eight. And Dylan Love will lead it off. Here in the eight, Shane Dennis and Denning Gary here at the ballpark. Shockers wrapping up a four-game week, four-game homestand, trying to stay perfect and sweep the Paladins out of town. Shockers trying to prove to 17 and four here in what I would say, Denning, is the early going, but it's not really early anymore. Third of the way through the season. And the last weekend series of the non-conference play, so. By now you kind of know what you are as a team and if you're still searching for an identity or searching for pieces you're going to be in some trouble it doesn't seem like that's the case for wichita state in the least so cody tyler the veteran of this team the red shirt senior from terrell texas making his 47th appearance pretty much split time between starting and relieving and then kind of an injury plagued career for him And a good start to the eighth inning. You're going to see an exceptionally quick arm from Cody Tyler. That is definitely his calling card. It gets on you in a hurry from the left side. He is one of those lefties who works off the extreme first base side of the rubber. It can create a real tough angle. Yeah, that's where I was. And... Back in the day, it was, okay, if a lefty was a soft thrower and threw sinkers, that's why he'd be on the extreme third base side of the uh, the uh, the rubber. If you're a breaking ball and fastball guy, you're on the extreme right-hand side where, or the first base side where Cody Tyler is now. I'm not sure what the theory is nowadays. Because you see a lot of guys on the opposite side of conventional you know to me this is conventional mm -hmm. Cody being on the first base side of the rubber at the very least be in the middle and I've seen some pitchers move around depending on what batter they're that's facing that's right I, I have a hard time seeing how that can be executed that's, that's yeah. hard to do late swing by Dylan Love there are times though when Cody He's working off this extreme first base side. He'll be in a left-on-left -left situation. He throws a fastball to the outside mm -hmm. part of the plate against the left-handed hitter where it just looks impossible to hit. If the ball is moving not in a straight line, right. but almost not a diagonal. And with his arm slot already, which he hides the ball very well with that short arm action, that's got to be tough. Yeah, to me, that's what makes it the toughest on a left-hand batter, which we're going to see, or at least scheduled here, Richards and Anderson. If you have a little crossfire to begin with and you're over there way on the first base side, it's hard to hang in there as a lefty. And a good frame that time by Gunnar Troutwine to stick it there. and 
Strikeout number 11 for Shocker pitching. First for Tyler. Gunner's gotten slowly but surely better at his pitch presentation and his pitch framing. It's all about being quiet. You're not trying to jab a ball back into mm -hmm. the strike zone. You're just, just hold it there. Catch it yeah. where it goes. Yeah, just hold it there. Like you, you said it best. Present it. Richards, one of the two hits today. He hit a mistake from Tommy Barnhouse in the right field. I think in a lot of ways, pitch framing gets a bit of a bad rap as deceiving umpires mm -hmm. trying to steal strikes that aren't really. But I've heard catchers who have talked about this who are particularly adept at doing so. They're not trying to deceive anybody. They're just trying to hold the pitch where it is and give the umpire a good look at it. Especially at the major league level, those umpires know what they're doing and they'll you're call not gonna, strikes you're if not it's a, a strike. You're not going to you know? fool those guys. Yeah. yeah. So but your job is just to make a strike look like a strike. And the other thing is when it crosses the plate, that's a little different angle or a little di different place than where it's actually caught. So if you hold it there, you're reminding the umpire that, hey, when this crossed the plate, keep in mind – now, here's where it is now, but where it crosses the plate is where you call it. So, especially on a pitch down, those are the tough ones to really stick, the ones down around the knees without pulling it back up into the strike zone. Listen to us, a couple of catching experts. Left handed <laughs> Out catchers, of frame. Yeah. <laughs> they wouldn't let me anywhere near a catcher's glove. I know what good catching looks like, that's for sure. Before we move on, real quick, can mm -hmm. I get your position on if a left-handed catcher is a feasible thing? I don't understand why not. Thank you. I'm, okay. I'm Good. baffled that there haven't been more, I guess. What's wrong with a left-handed catcher? I guess that it's slightly harder to throw down to second base because there's more right-handed hitters. That's, I don't know. I don't know either. I know that was a pretty good play by Jordan Boyer. A hot shot to his right. Two away. Jordan played it into his body here, and that was smacked off the bat of Richards. As a second baseman, you have the luxury of being able to knock a ball down and still have time, but Jordan recovers there on that hip-high bounce, sets his feet, makes the accurate throw. Cody Tyler, two-thirds of the way through this eighth inning. That may have been as much about his bare hand as it was his glove hand, I think. In gathering that one in, that may have been 50-50 at best. So here's Ben Anderson with maybe one last chance to break through here. He's had a miserable series at the plate. Shocker pitchers have really worked him over. That's the fastball I was talking about from Tyler, left on left to the outside part of the plate. At 89, 90 miles an hour with his angle. Good luck. And I'm glad you brought that up because he pitches like he throws 94. He's fearless with his fastball. And 89-90 is certainly nothing to sneeze at out of a left-hander, but you see a lot of guys that top out at 89-90 throw a lot of breaking balls and a lot of change-ups, but really not much out of this guy. Here it is, hit it. Good spot. Yep. That's where I would have gone to. Take it out there a little further. Anderson willing to take pitches. So you, if you can get ahead of him with a couple of nicely spotted fastballs, now you're in the driver's seat. and It opens up the whole repertoire. Anderson at the moment is one for eight in the series with five strikeouts. He and Richards had singles in the third. That has been it. None before or since. Only one base runner since the third. That was a walk. Still two and two. Chandler Sandburn loosening just in case. Shockers in the eighth will have nine, one, and two in the order.
Three and two. See how far he can hit it here. Tough for a left-handed hitter to get one out to right field today. And Anderson has only been aboard once of his own volition with that single in the third. See if Cody just challenges him with a fastball. He did, and we'll do it again. One way or another, this is probably Cody Tyler's last hitter. I would agree. With the long string of seven straight right-handed hitters due up after Anderson. Of course, you'd love to give Chandler Sandburn a clean ninth inning to work with, but Todd Beller may not have that luxury. He lost him. So a two-out walk, and there's the tying run on there. Brett Hebner, 0 for 3 today, 1 for 10 in the series. And it appears that Cody Tyler will get at least one more. Hebner hit a ground ball to short with the bases, or uh, with two on. Yeah, the bases loaded in the third. And that brought the only run of the game home for Furman. Little fuzzy ground ball to the shortstop, and that's that. Cody Tyler turns in a scoreless eight. The bullpen continues to dominate for Wichita State. State University is Shocker Nation. We exceed expectations, push boundaries, seize opportunities, and move boldly ahead. We are student-centered and innovation-driven. It's who we are. Our vision is simple but powerful. Create, innovate, collaborate, and celebrate with one unifying purpose, to shock the world. Well, what Wichita State hopes is their last at bat. Nine, one, and two in the order due up facing Matt Lazaro, who has thrown seven excellent innings, but he finds himself on the short end of a two-to-one score. Shane and Denning here at the ballpark. Shockers trying to sweep the Paladins in what I think to this point, you would agree, Denning, be one of the most, if not the most, complete three-game series the Shockers have put together from start to now. Hard to argue with. I think the Shockers have flashed all three elements of their game in different games of this series. Obviously, it was the offense that got the, the shining star next to them on Friday, day, Friday and Saturday. But today, they've had to do it with pitching and defense. And for eight innings, at least, that's been enough. So here's Young trying to get the Shockers at least one more. He's bunted his way on and grounded to short. You know you're facing a tough ombre when you only get three at bats, but the middle and lower part of the order may have to settle for just that. There you see the pitch count for Matt Lazaro. Only 93. Had him reaching and out in front, it's one and two. Paladins had only eight hits in the first two games of the series. They've added two more. So they have nine singles and a double so far through two games and eight innings. Young tests Crawford. Crawford's had a good series at third base. Right 
Luke Ritter's had a good series. Single in three trips today. Flight out to deep center his last time up there. That young at bat, a pretty good example of how Lazaro has gotten it done over the last couple of innings. Gets himself ahead and counts. Forces you to be out on your front foot. Little change up there to a right-handed hitter. Had Young reaching. Ritter swats one foul. Nothing in one to him. The second inning was pretty much it. Against Tommy Barnhouse, Dylan Love reached on an error, came around to score on a ground out. And then in the bottom of the inning, Young a bunt single, Ritter a single to left. And that one's blasted to left, and there's some insurance. Luke Ritter gives the Shockers a two-run lead. His third home run, RBI number 11. And Lazaro finally made a mistake, Denny. Well, we've been waiting for it. It hasn't come yeah. for at least three or four innings, but Luke Ritter has rewarded the faith from Todd Butler, keeping him in the top of the order. Got himself a hanging changeup there on the inner part of the plate and absolutely did not miss it. That ball was destroyed. Got out of here in a hurry. Home run number 26 on the year for the Shockers. Right back in the strike zone to Vickers, who's two out of three, a pair of singles. Vickers, an afterthought of a swing, nothing in two. So that's five home runs now in the series for the Shockers. They had six singles before that in this game that is <laughs> Vickers gives one a ride to left center but Richard was playing deep and he's got room in front of the warning track so Richards learned a little something from the elements Backed up a few extra steps and was able to haul in that long drive from Vickers. Two away. Didn't quite catch it on the good part of the bat. Trajectory looked okay. But that's a deep part of the park as well and hangs up there for Richards. Looks like Matt Lazaro is going to get denied the opportunity to throw a complete game. Gets a handshake and a job well done, but much like Nick Verbeck, his best, at least so far, hasn't quite been good enough. Wichita State University is preparing today's students to become tomorrow's leaders. The Shock the World campaign is raising $25 million in private funds for a new home for the W. Frank Barton School on the Innovation Campus. Invest today in tomorrow's business leaders by calling 316-978-4076 or visit www.wichita.edu slash shock the world. Furman will turn it over to Heath Hawkins, big junior right-hander from Matthews, North Carolina. Missed the first month or so with an injury, but has been good since then. He had to knock off a little rust in the Harvard series where he walked four in two innings. But in the finale of that game, or that series, two-thirds scoreless, an inning scoreless against College of Charleston on Wednesday. So Hawkins trying to make up for lost time and He's trying to get the final out of the eighth inning. He gets Alec Bohm. Matt Lazaro, man, feel bad for him. He turned in a beauty, exactly what Furman needed, but the Shocker pitching staff has continued to keep the clamps on the Paladin offense, Denny. Lazaro's going to be a good one, just a freshman, and that's an exciting thing to think about if you're a Furman fan. He will be in this rotation for a while moving forward, but baseball can be a cruel game, and seven and two-thirds strong innings doesn't look like it's going to be enough unless the Paladin offense can rally in the ninth. 
So Hawkins and Bohm with the bases clear and two away. Luke Ritter's solo home run here in the eighth has provided a little bit of breathing room for the Shockers. Bohm shoots one the other way over toward the line. A long run for Kay, but it's going to twist into foul ground and fall untouched as Alec Bohm continues to try to use the entire field. Certainly understand Brett Harker not wanting Lazaro to face Bohm for a fourth time. Been on base twice against him already. And this is a guy who can provide one more insurance run with one swing. So Hawkins out there for the fourth time. He spikes one and throws it to the backstop. Three and two thirds, still hadn't given up a hit. It'll be three, four, and five in the order for the Paladins in the ninth. They'll need at least two to tie. Three and one. All fastballs so far from Heath Hawkins, and it looks like he has overthrown the last couple, trying to drag him to the arm side just a little bit. Boom, now in the driver's seat. Got in on him just enough, and it, but he muscles it out to center field. It carries to Anderson, and Bohm is retired. Last chance for the Paladins coming up in the ninth. Charles Koch Arena is the place where we gather as a community to compete against the very best. Now our game plan is to renovate Koch Arena by adding a new student athlete success center. Your tax deductible gift can help deliver that slam dunk. Join us at the level that is right for you. Donate online at wichita.edu slash shock the world. Chandler Sandburn trying to nail it down for the Shockers here in the top of the ninth. Wichita State with two in the third and one in the eighth. Chandler Sandburn trots out his ridiculous strikeout numbers. Nearly two per inning. Sandburn working for the first time in this series. He got the final two outs in the Oklahoma game on Tuesday, earning his seventh, uh, second save. So it'll be Sandburn against Jake Crawford, Brandon Elmy, and Landon Kay. Three, four, and five for the Paladins here in the ninth. You love getting that insurance run in the eighth inning just so that one swing of the bat can't make this a tie ball game because runners have been few and far between against Sandburn so far this year. Just the six hits and 13 innings of work. Jabari Richards and Ben Anderson singled back to back in the third. That's it? Period, yeah. That's not a dot, dot, dot. That's it. One ball and one strike. Crawford 0 for 3. And in the series, just one out of ten. It's amazing, really, when you think about it. This late in the third game of the series that only one guy has more than one hit for Furman. That's Landon Kay, who's due up third in the inning. He has two. 
Richard single in the third gives him two. There you go. But that's still not great. And they've both been singles. That's maybe the biggest part of it. Yep. It's just that if you look at Furman's three-run rally in the eighth inning yesterday, they had to do it with four singles and a walk. And if that's what it takes to put up a crooked number, you're going to have a hard time replicating that with any kind of consistency. Well, they ran into an absolute buzzsaw this weekend. Into right, Ritter in his tracks, one away. Can of corn for Luke Ritter. Sandburn got ahead of Crawford. Looked like he tried to slide her to the outer third of the plate that time that stayed elevated enough, but not much that Crawford could do with it out away from him. One big out. Elmy has hit it to center field a couple of times, bracketing a strikeout. Sandburn coming right at him, and why not? Armed with 95. That error by Vickers in the third helped kick the door open for that run that they did get. And if not for that, Shockers might be knocking on the door of their second shutout. Boyer into shallow right, gathers that one in, two away. Good communication between Boyer and Ritter out in right field. That's not an easy play if you have two guys converging, one going out, one coming in. And again, as an infielder, you are taught to keep going until you get called off. And that's exactly what Boyer did. Brandon Kay will be the last hope for the Paladins. I think you had the tidbit of the weekend that Furman has never, ever in baseball come this far west. Wichita, Crazy. Kansas is as far west as the Paladin program has ever come. Well, like we said yesterday, there's so many good programs in that area of the country that they could play in the non-con. It's yep. easy to see why they... Stay out there, and this weekend might reinforce the fact that they are not going to be traveling west anytime soon. May not be the west part, the Wichita part, probably. Sure, yeah. <laughs> Has more to do with Go it. Go further west. Yeah. Just avoid this part. 0 oh 2 to K. Wichita State sweeps Furman and in the process allows nine singles and a double all weekend long. Denning and I will be back to recap it all when we come back. Wichita State University is preparing today's students to become tomorrow's leaders. The Shock the World campaign is raising $25 million in private funds for a new home for the W. Frank Barton School on the Innovation Campus. Invest today in tomorrow's business leaders by calling 316-978-4076 or visit www.wichita.edu slash shock the world. It was a thrashing, really, any way you slice it. Wichita State over Furman in three games this weekend. They improved to 17-4. and four. They win all four games this week. They take their show on the road to Central Arkansas and then to ECU. Uh, if this was a tune-up denning, then I don't doubt that Todd Butler will have anything to complain about. I think there's a lot of good things for Wichita State that happened this weekend. The starting pitching, first and foremost, in my mind, Cody Hoyer, Liam Eddy, and Tommy Barnhouse combined to allow five hits in their three starts and that is really good the bullpen was outstanding today the offense providing just enough after carrying the load on Friday and Saturday and the defense doing their part as well it was just a well-rounded performance and the Shockers can be very happy with 17 and 4. 
There was an error and two singles in the third. Otherwise, the Paladins got two base runners, both on bases on balls. So Wichita State sweeps. They go to 17 and four. Furman heads back to South Carolina at 13 and 11. And Wichita State on quite a roll. For Denning, I'm Shane. Thanks for watching. See you next time on WSU TV.